<laughs> now my co-mates and brothers in exile, hath not old custom made this life more sweet than that of painted pomp? Are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we not the penalty of Adam, the season's difference, as the icy fang and churlish chiding of the winter's wind, which, when it bites and blows upon my body, even till I shrink with cold, I smile and say, this is no flattery. These are counsellors that feelingly persuade me what I am. Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. I would not change it. Happy is your grace that can translate the stubbornness of fortune into so quiet and so sweet a style. Come, shall we go and kill us venison? And yet it irks me, the poor dappled fools, being native burghers of this desert city, should in their own confines with forked heads have their round haunches gored. Indeed, my lord, the melancholy Jaquiz grieves at that, and in that kind swears you do more usurp than doth your brother that hath banished you. I love to cope him in these sullen fits, for then he's full of matter. <laughs> Go seek him, tell him I would speak with him. He saves my labor by his own approach. Oh. Why, how now, monsieur? What a life is this, that your poor friends must woo your company? <laughs> what? You look merrily. <laughs> a fool, a fool! I met a fool in the forest, a motley fool, a miserable world, as I do live by food. I met a fool who laid him down and basked him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms, and yet a motley fool. Good morrow, fool, quoth I. No, sir, quoth he. Call me not fool till heaven hath sent me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his poke, and looking on it with lacklustre eye, says very wisely, it is ten o'clock. <laughs> Thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it was nine, and after one hour more twill be eleven, and so from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. <laughs> when I did hear the motley fool thus moral on the time, my lungs began to crow like chanticleer that fools should be so deep contemplative, and I did laugh, sun's intermission, an hour by his dial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, noble fool, oh, worthy fool, motley's the only where. What fool is this? A worthy fool, one that hath been a courtier. Oh, that I were a fool. I am ambitious for a motley coat. Thou shalt have one. Forbear, <laughs> <laughs> and eat no more. Why, I have eaten none yet. Oh, shut not, till necessity be served. Of what kind should this cock come of? Art thou thus bold and man by thy distress, or else a rude despiser of good manners, that in civility thou seem'st so empty? You touch my vein at first. The thorny point of bare distress hath ta'en from me the show of smooth civility. Yet am I inland bred, and know some nurture. But forbear, I say, he dies that touches any of this fruit, till I and my affairs are answered. And you will not be answered with reason. I must die. What would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. I almost die for food, and let me have it. Sit down and feed, and welcome to our table. Speak you so gently? Pardon me, I pray you. I thought that all things had been savage here, and therefore put I on the countenance of stern commandment. But whate'er you are, that in this desert inaccessible, under the shade of melancholy boughs, lose and neglect the creeping hours of time. If ever you have looked on better days, if ever been where bells have knolled to church, if ever sat at any good man's feast, if ever from your eyelids wiped a tear, and know what tis to pity and be pitied, let gentleness my strong enforcement be, in the which hope I blush, and hide my sword. True is it that we have seen better days. Therefore sit you down in gentleness, 
and take upon command what help we have that to your wanting may be ministered. Then but forbear your food a little while. Whilst like a doe I go to find my fawn and give it food. There is an old poor man who after me hath many a weary step limped in pure love. Till he be first sufficed, oppressed with two weak evils, age and hunger, I will not touch a bit. Go find him out, and we will nothing waste till you return. I thank you, and be blessed for your good comfort. Thou seest we are not all alone unhappy. This wide and universal theatre presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. One man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy, with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. <laughs> and then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the part, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good cape and lined, with eyes severe and beard a formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again toward childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. <laughs> Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history, his second childishness and mere oblivion, Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. <laughs> Give us some music and good cousin, sing. Then hey, hold on. 